So my name is Paul Kenyon. I'm a, a journalist, an author, and um, I have worked in television for the last 25 years. And um, I've reported on wars in Libya and Ukraine and the drug wars in Colombia. It goes on like this for 40 kilometers. Plenty of space for the people smugglers to bring the migrants down here by cover of night, launch them off in those small wooden boats and head them towards the Italian island of Lampedusa or sometimes to Malta, the first steps into Europe. I started off by being a, a reporter in local radio and then regional television. And people realized that um, I was constantly looking to try and find the truth behind things and always suspicious of people and always looking for corruption and criminality. So uh, my old boss in regional television, I was very fortunate, he gave me my own strand, which was called Open to Question. So instead of saying these people are all criminals, we called it Open to Question. So I had to go and find corrupt businesses or corrupt businessmen uh, or corrupt local officials and try and prove it on screen. You're a people trafficker, aren't you? What you do is you smuggle people yes, around the world, don't you? No, no, no. You, no. you put them in the hold here, they're like cattle. And I wanted to go off piste and try and do something original. So originality and the revelation contained in investigations are what really appealed to me. Hey, Paul Kenyon from... Oh. Oh. Mr. Bennett, that's an assault. I've come to talk to you about your extraordinary powers of prediction. I got a reputation amongst my colleagues for wanting to do work that had uh, an element of risk to it. And quite often those investigations uh, would take me to uh, foreign countries where I do a lot of secret filming. So I would go to places like Turkey or Iran and go with secret cameras. And once people realized that, so well, Paul Kenyon he seems to, I mean, if he's got uh, this within him, that he wants to go and uh, do secret filming in fairly dangerous countries, he should also do some war reporting. And actually, all that happened was gradually people saw me as, yeah, somebody who's willing to take a risk and therefore we'll send him to, to, to countries where there's some hostilities. Up until a few weeks ago, we're being rounded up and captured by Gaddafi regime loyalists. And now, they're the ones doing the hunting. Ah! 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 Then, incoming fire. The Ukrainian situation had been bubbling under for quite a long time, and so this was um, students and activists trying to overthrow their government, which they saw as a repressive uh, sort of neo-communist government. Um, and. Uh, it had been picking up for months and months, so there'd been protests on the streets. But when I say protests, not in the British sense of people screaming and shouting on the streets. I mean, there'd been guns fired, there'd been people killed, and it was picking up. And um, I had been in contact with a number of different um, student groups on the ground to try and find out what was happening. And at some point, and this is normal in most of this industry, an editor will say, we're going to have to do the Ukraine story. And there's a clamour of people who want to go. So I was just one of several people who said, I want to go. And then you have to sort of sell yourself to your editor because he's going to say, why you? Why you? So I had to say, look, I've got lots of contacts there. I know quite a lot about the region. Um, I've been around that region before. Um, I could have said my wife's from pretty close to that, from the country that borders it. But, I, but anything that you can throw into the pot to get yourself the gig, um, you do. Behind the Balaclavas was a, a tough piece of filmmaking uh, because obviously we're doing it entirely without the cooperation of the men who are there uh, fighting for their cause. So our difficulty was that as, when, when we moved around, it became quite well known at that point that um, in Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine at the time, um, 
a lot of uh, the Russian activists or the Russian sympathizers wore balaclavas. They never took them off, so you could never find out who you were talking to. It's a really, um, it's quite a distressing thing if everywhere you go, it's freezing cold, empty plains, and you, when you come to a roadblock, which they had a lot of, um, it's on fire. So all their roadblocks were on fire. So they would set up huge banks of tires and the whole thing would go. So you'd come around the corner and you'd just see in the middle of a plane these huge fires and you know you have to drive towards it because that's where the, the road takes you and you'd get there and there were all these guys standing there with machine guns, with AK-47s or whatever. And as you turn up, you'd have to approach the, um, uh, these roadblocks very, very cautiously and they would come over and they would go tap, tap, tap on the window and you'd pull the window down. It's, it's quite a difficult thing to do actually, to pull your window down if somebody's got a gun in your face because your instinct is let me the hell out of here, put your foot down and let's go. And that's not what you should do. We passed the Ukrainian army already in retreat. The towns surrounded by roadblocks. Here, there's no way through. We try another route, but we're met with hostility. So you have to pull the window down and say hi and be and be very, very calm with them. Don't allow anything to kind of kick off, nothing incendiary, no sudden movements. And um, I was with a, my producer, has a PhD in Russian studies, spoke fluent Russian, and was able to put his hand out the window quite a lot from the car and just say, hey, how are you, in Russian, and get everybody to calm down. And I think that showing courtesy and showing understanding, showing that you speak the language and you understand their position as well, helped to calm things down. But behind the balaclavas was um, one of those stories where when you come home, uh, it, it has been such a surreal experience that you uh, wake up in the middle of the night and it's, you, you know, in, in, a, in a sudden start because you, you keep putting yourself back there. It's very difficult to get that level of stress out of your mind. And the difficulty is that um, when you're in it, even though you know it's stressful, you don't let it show and you kind of swallow it, it's there, it's internal. And um, it tends to come out later, which is you know, to do with post-traumatic stress disorder. This is why people get it, it comes out later when you least expect it. And so you might be sitting there having a coffee in West London, where you, and there might be a firework that goes off, particularly this time of year, where my wife always thinks it's astonishing that a small firework will go off, and I still go. And, and it's just because you're kind of plugged into that, you think that spells something that's not good. But just back to the, um, behind the balaclavas was um, one of those stories where the, the people behind the balaclavas were doing a lot of kidnapping at the time. So every time, and kidnapping Western journalists, so every time you turn up at a roadblock or you try to move around the country, they would come out of nowhere, drag you out of the car, there'd be a lot of shouting. It's difficult, I don't speak the language, so I don't even know what they're shouting about. So you're getting it all secondhand, which adds to the, the stress. And uh, they were taking, some of my colleagues were taken off uh, one morning, uh, hoods put over their heads and mock executions done. I remember going back to uh, a war zone hotel in Ukraine and uh, um, there was a guy sitting next to me from, a, 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 I think he was from CBS, he was from CBS. So nothing to do with me, I don't work for CBS. But he just, and I knew him vaguely and I said, how did he go with you today? And he had, a, he had some beer and he said, yeah, it was all right. And I said, go on, so what happened? And he said, oh, well, they took us hostage at the beginning of the day and then they put a balaclava on my head and took me off and I was saying, what? And he said, yeah, and then they took me off and then he said, and they lined us up in this field and he said, and I thought they were going to kill me and I thought, that's probably it. And I said, okay. And he was complete, as he told me, he was telling me like, like he was talking that, you know, he'd just gone down to the shops to kind of buy a new cat or something. And I said, okay, because that's pretty serious. And he said, no, no, I'm okay. And he said, and then they put this gun against my head and pulled the trigger. And I just, and I thought he was over anyway, it wasn't. And I said, and how long ago was that? And he said, um, well, we got back about like an hour ago. And I said, oh my God. I mean, I, I think, it's, he was so hardened to it, because I would have probably wanted to just go back upstairs and, I don't know, watch Downton Abbey or something, but I, you know, his, his immediate reaction was to walk in the bar with his hand open and, and have some drinks, because it's the only way you can quickly, people feel that you can quickly come down. Whenever we'd finished a day's filming in um, Ukraine, we would get back in the car, and there'd be four or five of us, and um, we'd all just get in, and like somebody turned a light off, everybody just fell asleep immediately and, and, and it was really interesting to, to watch because one day I only noticed it because one day I was really agitated and didn't and within seconds of getting in the car everybody
apart from the driver, of course, they were instantly asleep. And it's because the enormous stress that you take all day, when you get a moment to switch off, your body, it's just, it's, it's such a primitive reaction. Your body just wants rest immediately. So your body seizes it whenever it can. So I've got some interesting ways of dealing with uh, the stress of uh, a war zone or a hostile environment. One of them is that um, I, I quite like wherever I am, even if there's gunfire outside and it's a very difficult situation, when I go to bed at night, I pull the covers over my head and I watch something on my iPod like Downton Abbey. Now, it sounds ridiculous, but actually, I remember doing it in Libya during the Civil War, and just to completely shut down from anything that's going on around you, I remember there was... Um, it's very, very noisy outside. Some of it was celebratory gunfire, some of it wasn't, but it was, it was a very sparky situation outside. And I remember just pulling the covers over my head, so you're in a kind of dark, in like a womb-like place, and putting on my, my iPad and just thinking, God, I can just relax, and you can feel your shoulders going down. And I'm entering into this kind of make-believe world of Edwardian England, which was so sumptuous. It was really lovely to do, actually, and it completely took my mind off the surroundings. There is humour in some of these very dark circumstances as well. And um, I mean, I remember being in, um, in, in Ukraine uh, and we're in quite a dangerous predicament. And uh, some of the rebels had taken over this town hall. They were all wearing their balaclavas. They've all got guns. There's a lot of shouting. They, they were burning uh, tires outside. And um, we, we got into this room with these very big guys. And it, you know, anything could happen. And it was quite funny because I walked over to them and um, they agreed that we could sit there whilst they, they were having their kind of lunch. And as they started eating, they were trying to eat this huge cake and they were ladling it up and they suddenly realised that they, well, they were wearing balaclavas. You can't eat cake with a balaclava. So they all, <laughs> and they all have to sort of go and put it under their balaclava. And then, but the funny thing, of course, it undermines their authority and their kind of the danger element, doesn't it? Suddenly it's quite, it's quite amusing. And they couldn't drink tea either. They kept having to go... <laughs> It's a young man's game or a young person's game because a lot of women do this as well and it, and it is a young person's game and I, you need the energy, you need a bit of recklessness about you, uh, you need to be a little bit wild to go and do it and you get to a particular age where you feel as though you've seen it and done it enough and you, you want to have some comfort and I, I don't mind going out and doing two or three weeks very occasionally but I don't want to be on the road because it's a lifestyle, it's something that you, you live so you miss all your family's birthdays, a lot of people um, end up getting divorced several times over. Um, you know, a lot of people never really settle down in a house. A lot of people don't really have any furniture. It's a kind of itinerant lifestyle for a lot of people, and so they live the work. And it's fine, because that appeals to some. But to most people, it doesn't. And you come to a point in your life where you just think, I, I just need to have some comfort and some predictability, and I don't always need to be on the move. I would definitely do it all over again. I think, um, you know, I've had really strong uh, colourful memories of, of, of some of these things. I mean, you know, some really sad moments, but powerful, emotionally powerful moments. And so, you know, I mean, not many people have been there with kind of hooded gunmen in Libya as they're bursting into buildings and firing shots into the air. And not many people have been there and seen Gaddafi up close and spent some time with his son amongst lions. And so you get these unique situations. Not many people have been. I've been in a Huey helicopter, which is an armed helicopter, flying over the Colombian jungle um, and in a firefight with rebels from below who are trying to grow cocaine and shooting up at our helicopter. And um, all that kind of thing. They say, you know, sometimes you sit there over a coffee in London and think, my God, I'm very lucky to have had all those experiences. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I would do it all again. I'd do it all again. <laughs>